Welcome back, everybody. We're at NAB New York again. I'm back here again with Dave. Today, we're here to talk about the Ursa City 12K. This is the 12K version, this right? This is the 12K, yeah. This... And we do now, you guys officially announced the 17K yes. as well. Yes. You guys announced that at ABC. And, and, the, and the Immersive, we officially the announced immersive, that as well. The Immersive, <laughs> which is an interesting camera that I need to have more time to wrap my head, brain around about it. But, uh, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit more about this guy. This has probably been the camera I have been the most intriguing, the most exciting yeah, about. Yeah. Um, now it's using the same sensor technology that you guys use on the Ursa Mini Pro 12K, which was the RGBW sensor. Correct. Yeah, brand completely different sensor, but but same same concept here. Same concept. Yeah. Uh, can you go a little bit more? How does this sensor? Uh, work because one of the cool things about it is that it does it ha you still have the full field of view yeah when you go down to resolutions like to 8k 4k yep but it's not doing anything like line skipping it's not doing pixel bidding and it's not down simply it's using sensor scaling correct so um how does that technology work in relationship with black magic raw and your color science that you have in this camera so starting with our uh, Ursa Mini 12K OLFP, well, with the 12K, and then later the optical low-pass filter version of it, uh, we're building our own sensor, right? So when we started building our own sensor, we were able to vertically align the color science, uh, which currently is Gen 5 color science, and the way we manage uh, the sensor and the pipeline going back into Resolve. In that case, what we did is we're not center cutting like we would on the Ursa uh, Mini Pro 4.6 you know, G2 and G1. Uh, we're actually using the full sensor. So no matter what the resolution is, we're taking advantage of all the pixels that are there mm -hmm. for us to be able to, to uh, use as much of the sensor as possible. And in this sensor, what we've done is we've added in a number of different uh, capabilities. So we go not only 8K and 12K, but 9K. So mm -hmm. it runs at super high speeds because we're managing the output of the sensor and we're managing uh, the whole pipeline through that we can get super high frame rates at, at varying rev, uh, resolutions mm -hmm. and utilizing again the full the full sensor uh, range. Okay, so and because and this is all happening at the sensor level. At the sensor level, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like because some of the readout speeds on this camera is, um, it's like it's if I remember correctly in the two four to one it's like sub yep. five milliseconds. Yeah, yeah, it's super fast, and the the frame rates are super high. So when you're getting the fast readout, giving you the high frame rates you're getting uh, super resolution slow motion, mm -hmm. right? It's super amazing footage yeah. at those high frame rates now. Yeah, and that's both the 8K and the 4K in that 2, 4 to 1, and also the read and the frame rates are the same, which is like 224 frames a second in the 4K and, and the 8K? Yep, exactly, exactly. That's, HD, you're down, you're almost up to 400. Yeah, <laughs> I, I thought I thought 8K 120 was already insane. Right. <laughs> 8K 240, 224 frames was like let me yeah. let me not over it. but um but yeah that's interesting so it's a and with the sensor it's it's really a blending of both black magic raws the the way you guys are now being able to take the pipeline with black magic raw yeah. and your gen 5 color science that you're really able to you know give all this different quality. and if our i was sensor our codec or you know the color science because we have that vertically aligned we can really manage that process uh, with fine fine detail yeah and if, if I were, and when I I used the Ursa uh, the Ursa Mini Pro 12K mm -hmm. on a short project, and I recall seeing that it, it when I opened it up in Resolve, it was reading out in 16 bit. Um, so, but I know the Black Magic Raw isn't in the container file like 12 bit, if I remember correctly. Yes. So I'm curious, like, so is this sort of is this actually like reading out at 16 bit? And it's just like putting in a compressed container, a 12-bit compressed container, where you black metric raw opens it up in the full 16-bit in DaVinci Resolve. Something like that. Something like that. <laughs> I'm I'm getting warmer. We're getting warmer. Okay. I don't I don't know the uh, the gruesome details on how that's working, but yeah. yeah you're, awesome. Okay. <laughs> you're over target. Uh, yeah. No. Um, and one of the things I absolutely love about both this and the 17K is the new media cars, the yes. media that you guys are using about it. That's the, eight so, terabytes? Yeah, so it, it ships with an eight terabyte. Um, what's really amazing about this storage, this is, the, this is the module it ships with. There's gonna be a 16 terabyte module as well. And if you come over to the cloud station, you'll see that there's a, there's a, uh, a, a module mount. Mm -hmm. When I put that in, I can read right off this drive, but yeah. I can also read right off the camera 
It's got it's got four lanes of by 16 PCI Express on the inside. Oh, I see it. Yeah. So that's super high band. One one of the things we found when we built the 12K was the the, the restriction wasn't on the resolution of the sensor, it was on the capability of the recorder. Yeah. So we built our own media to, to take full advantage of those high frame rates and high, high uh, bit depths and all that. Yeah. So this is really kind of a cool thing is that if I hook in on the ethernet port on the side, I can actually be on a resolve station editing footage while I'm shooting, yeah. color grading while I'm shooting on the clips and even in live link, which we're also showing at the cloud station, yeah. live link with the, with the camera is footage coming in and I have that in my timeline. I can be editing while it's still shooting and feeding that through my cloud, uh, my cloud yeah. live link. No, I love that just because just from a, just from a security safe, so yeah. it's longevity standpoint where I essentially I don't have to take the media out. I could just plug right. right into the Ethernet port. Right. I can get my media files out there. If you don't want to pay the extra cost for the for the dock, right. you can get it right off through the 10-bit, and it's it basically it could just stay there. And you can kind of depending on the what you're shooting resolution-wise, this can be basically like a, a a temporary backup for our storage as well. And as you mentioned, you got the the wire transfer for Blackmagic yep. Cloud. Yep. Wireless so, wireless connection here on the back. Um, so that was another, uh, so we had a couple different ways of, of dealing with the media. We, we really wanted to compress that, that, that space between what was considered post-production and production. It's all one contiguous yeah. event now. I've been uh, working with the Blackmagic Cloud for doing a lot of with, yeah. working with remote editors. It's such a helpful, it's just so helpful that I can just have the files, just put it, it like, goes right to the cloud. And then my editors, it's like wherever they are, they can just go, they got proxies yeah. that goes right in there. Yep. They can do that, tweak it. I'm more of a colorist. I love tweaking with the colors. So I like, like you do this, I'll keep the original files and then I'll go in and just swap yeah. them out and just put it in for final delivery. Uh, and this guy is, st is starting to ship now too, if yep. I'm correct. Yep, right? out the door now. Yep. yep. So when you, if you were to buy the, the one without necessarily the EVF, that comes with the camera, you get two, the pretty much, the pretty much everything uh, minus the, the EVF, right? That's really the big uh, yep. uh, addition there. Yep. The, the media cards come with eight terabytes of media. Yep. You got the beam mount. You yep. need, obviously, you need to get beam, separate beam mount batteries for, mm -hmm. for it. Yep. Yep. But yeah, no, this is. Uh, this it's, a, is, it's a beast. It's a beast. <laughs> well, it was a beast. Yeah. Then you guys announced the 17K, a, a, a medium format. Yeah, yeah. So the, the idea there is that when we built this camera, we were looking at, again, a, a life cycle of you know years and years and being able to take the same form factor. So if you put this up against the Ursa Mini Pro, it's a little bit wider, a little bit bigger, a little bit longer. And that allowed us for more range. So the sensor is going to be a, uh, a change out in the same form factor, same body. So all the accessories will be the same. And then you've got the 17K sensor. Mm -hmm. And then the immersive camera is going to give you that, the two 8K essentially, two 8K yeah. uh, images on the one 17K sensor. Yeah. Let's talk about the 17K just yep. for a little bit. Yep. 65 millimeter 60, full frame. <laughs> 65 millimeter uh, large format. Yeah. I, when I first heard it, I, I said that you guys are really, you know, rattling up the industry again, but the idea that uh, I think a lot of people may not realize is how significant having just having a 65 millimeter sensor that you guys just announced the price and it's thirty thousand dollars. But yeah, twenty nine 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 five. Yep. Yeah. Um, can you sort of just go in a little bit more? Like, why is that such a big deal that you have a sensor that large? At I know most people would think that when I say accessible. Uh, range, oh, they is. may be like thinking up, we're crazy, but yeah. when you start looking at other 65 millimeter format, one, I don't know any other one that you can't even buy, purchase alone. That's right. And the and when you start looking at the rental costs, but yeah, that's going to be really the big the big thing is that right, it's accessibility, right? The market is is ready for it. They want this kind of thing. I mean, beautiful when you get anamorphic on on a 65 millimeter uh, frame, it just looks beautiful and and you've got all of that range to work with scale-wise. We're looking at bigger and bigger um, display environments. If we look at things like the Sphere in, in Las Vegas or uh, Cosm's you know, uh, event uh, facilities that are coming out, uh, certainly all the IMAX theaters everywhere, shooting in native 65 is going to give you a capability to really take advantage of that real estate, visual real estate, uh, to be able to shoot. But another one is the new head-mounted displays have that capability. Even though small, 
the resolution and the and the overall angle of view is going to take advantage of that. You're talking about those, the Apple, the like Apple, the Apple Vision, Vision Pro, Pro, yeah, and so, the, and and some of the other ones coming out, uh, okay. the Meta Quest Three and things yeah. like that. Yeah. Yes. So so large large display like Sphere. It, yeah. Um, obviously IMAX. Obviously those are some of the things that you want to go. That I think we're expecting to go. Yeah. Where would you be? excited or interesting to see a camera of that format being showing up. As with almost all the Blackmagic stuff, by lowering the barrier to accessibility, it opens up the creative possibilities that we don't even know. We're, we're gonna wanna see what people are gonna do with that capability now accessible. Uh, we thought, you know, again, it's a beast of a camera, it has a lot of capability to it. You change that sensor out to that high resolution, you know, that, that big format sensor, and, and you have already all of this other capability where I have a fully riggable camera, I have a whole bunch of different capabilities like my, my uh, media docs and things like that. Who knows? I mean, now you're gonna have filmmakers who are gonna go like, well, I would have never thought of that because I don't think I would have had a chance to get my hands on something of, yeah. that, of that scale. Now they will. Yeah, no, that, that was, and that's sort of the thing is me as a filmmaker, that's, that. I mean, well, even, that's, even rental houses who would say, hey, I can actually own uh, you know, oh, yeah. dozens of these things at the uh, and rent them out. Now I'll be able to rent them, even if I didn't want to own one. Thirty thousand may still be out of a budget of your yeah. independent filmmaker who's it's like, yeah. why would I keep that camera? But yeah, no, I, rental houses. I, I agree, rental houses are going to be sure. huge. And just me as a filmmaker, like that was the thing that when I, when I was seeing that was the thing that was like, yeah. I mean, look, thirty-five millimeter format. I was like, okay, yeah, that's about where you really. But now seeing that going beyond that, where where I thought like things where you can do, you know, move, where you can do projects that are on the scale of like Dune or Joker with those large Absolute, formats. Absolutely. It's, it's actual a possibility. Yeah. yeah. So, You're an independent filmmaker, access to that kind of tech technology. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I, and I, I, I can't wait to see it. Um, and that's coming in the end of the year, right? Towards the end of the year. Yeah. Towards the end of the year. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Thank you, Great. Dan. James, thank you so much. So much. <laughs> Once again, we're here at NAB New York. Tune in for more content.